Well, I'll begin by saying thanks to everybody for logging in. We sure appreciate your time. This webinar is going to focus in on the fundamentals of fitting the ICD FlexFit, the lens construction, and basic fundamentals of what you need to know about the fitting of scleral in general. My name is Randy Kojima, and um, I'm hoping that this session will be a great beginning for those of you who are new to scleral, or if you're not, and you're experienced and, but might be new to the ICD FlexFit, I hope this will have some valuable information. Now, this will be part one. There'll be a second part coming up in July that we'll talk about, which will cover more advanced concepts. Now, the session has been sponsored by the ABB Optical Group in the U.S., which is the exclusive manufacturer and distributor of the ICD FlexFit. And in Canada, Cardinal Contact Lens and Precision Technology is the place to get the ICD FlexFit on the, the north side of the 49th parallel. Now, who are scleral candidates? And a patient with a corneal thinning disorder is certainly somebody that you're you're thinking of uh, the scleral as an option. A patient with post-refractive surgery issues, with aberrations, with issues with uh, quality of vision. Your corneal transplant patients that are really struggling with the visual quality they're achieving with uh, the, their habitual lenses. And then a big portion of the patients that are being fit are ocular surface disease eyes where we place the scleral lens on with that bowl of fluid trapped in behind that, as some of my colleagues call it, a, creating a, an eye spa for the patient. So scleral lenses are a great option for some of these highly irregular and diseased cases. Now, are there limits to where the flex fit might be used? Is it only for keratoconus or is it only for a transplant patient? Or is it really best suited for a normal eye? And the story is virtually any eye shape is a candidate for a scleral lens. And the reason for that is, we are going to vault over all this irregularity that you see in these corneal topographies. All of these patients struggle with best corrected VA in conventional glasses, soft lenses, and in GP lenses, they may be able to achieve the vision, but for the practitioner, creating a lens that's centering, a lens that's comfortable, a lens that has an appropriate physiologic response, that might be a challenge. And that's where the scleral is really advantageous because it doesn't matter how irregular the cornea is, you're going to vault completely over top of that irregularity. You're going to use the more symmetric nature of the sclera to work to your advantage. That landing that we create in the more normal, the more regular shaped sclera, creates a lens that's stable, a lens that doesn't move a great deal and therefore is comfortable, and a lens that can deliver the vision through the GP lens optics. Now, why the ICD FlexFit? One of the considerations is that it was built based on the more recent understanding that we have of scleral shape. And when I say more recent, I'm talking about since the millennium and the use of OCTs to better study the peripheral corneal, limbal, and scleral shape. And what we see from the OCT is that the peripheral cornea at approximately 10 millimeters becomes more tangent or straight line in shape. And that tangency generally runs out to a diameter of approximately 20 millimeters across the eye. So much of the anterior segment is tangent in that peripheral corneal limbus and scleral area before the eye begins to curve again. And the ICD and the ICD FlexFit, both the original and the newer FlexFit, were built based on this understanding that that peripheral cornea and sclera are tangent. Therefore, the lens uses a series of tangents in its construction. Of course, the center needs to be curved because the cornea is curved, but in the peripheral cornea, you have your first tangent, then you have your second tangent that brings the lens toward the surface of the eye, and then you have your landing zone. 
And that's another thing that makes the ICD FlexFit unique is the created shape that it uses allows for it to fit many different angles of underlying surface without needing to be modified. Now, do we need to customize the landing? For sure. But in general, the way the scleral landing zone or the final section of the lens has been constructed, it's generally quite forgiving. Now, when you receive your ICD FlexFit trial set, you'll notice there are two diameters, the 14.8 and the 16.3. Now, why would you use one or the other? Do you use the 14.8 only for small eyes? Do you use the 16.3 only for large eyes or large fissures? When do we start with one or the other? Well, one of the considerations is definitely the fissure size. If you have a patient with an incredibly deep set eye, this is going to be a tough patient to get the lens in and out on. Um, that may be difficult for the practitioner and it may be a real struggle for the patient. When there's a lot of tissue, a lot of bone and mass to move out of the way, it's going to be tough to get a big scleral lens in. When you have a small fissure, but not an issue with a deep set eye. For instance, an Asian eye isn't necessarily a difficult patient for scleral because we generally don't have a deep set eye. We don't have issues with the brow or a lot of mass tissue around the opening. So therefore, think about the fissure size when you're looking at the deep set eye. That's the one that you're most concerned with and that's definitely a patient you might consider the smaller diameter lens. Otherwise, most eyes we can get a 16.3 millimeter lens on. It's just a question of how much can you move that lid at 12 and 6 o'clock out of the way. Now, certainly a consideration when choosing the small or large diameter is the irregularity. When you're dealing with a very symmetric eye shape, you don't have such a deep bulge that you need to get over. When that anterior segment is relatively low in depth, you can use a smaller diameter lens. But when you have a, a more bulging condition, then you need a larger vault. You need a bigger diameter to create a bigger depth to get over that irregularity. So when you're thinking, do I go with the small or do I go with the large, a emerging keratoconic patient might suit a smaller diameter scleral, but a keratoglobus is almost certainly going to need the larger of the lenses. Now, another consideration is visible iris diameter. And as a rule of thumb, if you take visible iris diameter and add 3.5 millimeters, that gives you a ballpark starting point of diameter. So if we take the patient on the left, we have a 10.5 millimeter visible iris. If we add 3.5 millimeters, that gives us a 14 millimeter total diameter. Obviously, if the minimum diameter that we'd want is 14 millimeters, we can certainly put a 14.8 ICD flex fit on that eye. However, if the visible iris diameter is 13 millimeters and we add 3.5 mils to that visible iris diameter, our starting lens should be in the neighborhood of 16.5 millimeters. No way a 14.8 is gonna work on that eye. So when you're in doubt, always start with the bigger lens, but certainly factor in visible iris diameter. If you have an incredibly small eye and a low amount of asymmetry, you may not need the 16.3. But if you have a larger cornea and a lot of asymmetry, then certainly you're thinking about the 16.3. The nice thing about a large lens is it's so incredibly forgiving. So when in doubt, use the 16.3. That should always be your starting point. And the reason why I say that is it's so incredibly forgiving because it clears the entire cornea very easily as well as clearing the limbus, which is important, and is it's able to land well beyond the sensitive tissues. So 16.3s are very easy to fit on most eyes because they create a, a 
deep enough vault throughout all the corneal tissue. However, the smaller lens, the visible iris diameter, the scleral angle, the, the irregularity of the cornea factors in in a much greater manner. And if you have a look at this video, is this a lens that you would increase the diameter on or would you increase the vault of the limbal clearance zone, the third zone of the lens? Can you tell from this pattern that definitely larger is the way to go, or do we simply need to ramp up the vault in that third zone of the lens? Well, to help you answer this question, the ICD FlexFit uses these what's called limbal clearance zone scribes. They denote the width of the limbal clearance zone, the third zone in the lens. Each one of these six scribes is 60 degrees apart and they're 0.6 millimeters wide. Now the limbal clearance zone should do just that. It should clear the limbus. So if 100% of this scribe is landing within the borders of the visible iris, it's definitely not clearing the limbus. So we certainly need a larger diameter lens. Now in this patient, we have a much smaller cornea and those limbal clearance zone scribes are at least 50% beyond in many areas. So that tells us that the limbal clearance zone is actually clearing the borders of the visible iris and most likely clearing the sensitive limbal area and the limbal stem cells. So in this case, we wouldn't need a larger diameter lens. Now when you look at those scribes, if they land 100% beyond the cornea or the borders of the visible iris, then you're happy. You know you have an appropriate lens diameter. When those scribes are 50% beyond the visible iris, then the chances are you have the right diameter. You might consider going up slightly larger, but the chances are this is an appropriate diameter. When those scribes land within the borders of the visible iris, then you need to talk to your consultant about upping the lens diameter because we simply won't be able to create the vault over the limbus. The lens is simply too small for that eye. Now, it's important to note that the limbal clearance zone scribes are only on the 14.8 millimeter di diameter diagnostics. And the reason for that is the 16.3, it almost always will clear the limbus or it will generally be a large enough diameter. And if it's not clearing the limbus, it's not a diameter change that we need. It's a change to the limbal clearance zone. So only the 14.8 millimeter diagnostics have these scribe marks and your custom lenses won't have them. Now, if, if you look at the floor scene pattern of this 14.8 on I at the top, you notice this thick band, especially at three and nine o'clock, where the lens appears to be laying itself down on the peripheral cornea and most likely at the limbus. So that lens is touching down at around the limbus and maybe just inside of. If we go up 0.3 millimeters, we have slightly less thinning of the pattern maybe less bearing, but there's still some, some thinning to the pattern. So we're not completely clearing the peripheral cornea and maybe not the limbus. Notice we've moved our point of bearing slightly farther out, but it's not till we jump up to a 15.4 millimeter diameter that we're actually clearing 360 degrees around. Thin here and thin here, but definitely clearing. It's just the fluid is thinner at that point. So vis the visible iris diameter is factors in and that also is a consideration for the starting lens diameter that you choose. More so in the small, less so in the large 16.3. Now the 14.8, because it may not be large enough for some of our eyes, it can flex up 
to a 15.5 millimeter diameter or flex down to a 14.5 millimeter diameter. So if you've used a 14.8 diagnostic and it has exactly 200 microns of apical clearance and you're utterly happy with the fit, but you need it to go up in diameter, then you can simply call up the consultant. They will make the diameter flex up or down and that apical clearance should be maintained. There's a algorithm that's calculated in when you go up or down in diameter. The important thing to know is that your 14.8 isn't the only diameter that you can fit. You can go down to 14.5, you can go up to 15.5. Now, in terms of the 16.3 millimeter, it too allows for diameter changes. You can flex that down to 15.5 or up to 17 millimeters. And again, the flex algorithm is designed to maintain the apical clearance you have in the diagnostic so that when you change that diameter, you're not going to end up with far too much or far too little apical clearance. Now, how do you choose the initial lens? Do we need the K readings? Do we need the topography? Is there some sagittal information we need to pull out of the OCT? And the answer is fitting the diagnostic lens or choosing a diagnostic lens is very easy. Arguably, it's as easy as steep, median, and flat in soft lens fitting. What you wanna do is consider the condition. Is this patient a normal cornea with ocular surface disease? Well, then you know the sagittal depth of that eye is relatively low. If it's a post-refractive surgery patient, then it's likely to be even lower in depth. If we're dealing with a emerging or early cone, then we're likely to be higher in depth. Pellucid, higher than that. Keratoconus, higher than pellucid. Keratoglobus, higher than all of them. And bulging graphs certainly can be as high as keratoglobus or higher. So think about the condition. That's how you choose the initial lens. Now, if you're using your 16.3 millimeter diagnostic set, it's essentially flat, median, or steep. Am I dealing with a normal cornea? That's a low depth eye. I'm simply starting with the 4,000 micron. If I have a keratoconic patient, that's a higher sagittal depth eye. Therefore, we should be going up in sagittal depth from 4,000 microns in the normal eye to 4,400 microns in the keratoconic eye. If we're dealing with the transplant, we're going to go up even higher, another 400 microns higher. Now, transplants come in all shapes, sizes, and depths, but when in doubt, always choose a higher depth trial lens than what you need. You want to put a lens on that definitely clears the cornea because you can always calculate with your consultant a lower sagittal depth custom lens. But if you put on a trial lens that hits the cornea, you don't know how much higher you need to go. Is it 200 microns? Is it 400 microns? Is it 600 microns before you actually clear the elevation of the cornea? So when you're choosing your lens, just think height. 4,000 microns for normal, 44 for keratoconus, 48 for transplant. And then you can go up or down based on sagittal depth. You'll notice that we're talking about the ICD in terms of height, sagittal depth in microns. We're not talking about the base curve. Do we go steeper or flatter? And that's because the base curve factors in much less in a scleral lens. It's all about the zones and how deep each one of the zones are. But there is an associated base curve, of course. Now, another thing you'll notice in the trial set is the 4,000 micron is a plano lens. The 42 minus 2, 44 minus 4, 46 minus 6. So if you think you've mixed up your trial lenses, simply put it on the lensometer and you will know exactly what sagittal depth that lens is. Now going to the 14.8 diagnostic set, similarly it's steep, median, flat. So here we have a normal cornea, we would be choosing a 3400. Keratoconus, again we're going up 400 microns. Transplant, we're going up 400 microns. And again, the trial lenses are labeled similarly. A 3400 minus 4, 
3,600 minus 6, 3,800 minus 8, and so on. So you can easily discern which trial lenses are which. Now, when you think about sagittal depth, it's everything you're going to do in scleral lenses. You choose your initial trial lens based on sagittal height. Then that lens goes on eye and you measure the fluid underneath in microns. Do I need to go deeper in trial lenses or do I need to go lower in trial lenses, but in microns? So you're always thinking microns. Now your 14-8 diagnostic set is separated by 600 microns from your 16.3. So if you put in, or if you attempted to put in the 16.3 lens and it was a struggle to get it in without a bubble. The lids were a real issue for the patient. You had a deeper set eye. You want to put on the equivalent 14.8. Then you simply subtract 600 microns and that tells you the appropriate 14.8 diameter. So 600 microns separates the two trial sets from each other. Now to apply a lens, you want some kind of stable platform the large DMV suction cup, a two-finger method, or a three-finger method. But to apply the lens with all the fluid, you need some kind of stable platform to bring that lens to the eye. Then you're going to fill up the bowl full of preservative-free saline. We want no preservative behind the lens trapped there for the hours that the patient may wear their custom lens. Then you're going to make a fluorescein soup, putting ample amount of fluorescein in the bowl and knowing that the vast majority of that fluorescein is going to get spilled onto the carpet, leaving only a small amount of the saline and fluorescein behind the lens. So put lots and lots of fluorescein in. Then it's time to apply. And if you've never applied a scleral lens, it can be intimidating. This is not something you may have been exposed to previously. So how do we get these lenses in? And I, I can certainly attest to the fact that I was pretty nervous the first time, but it's actually much easier than, than one would presume. Here's a video that I'd encourage you to record. Uh, go to the scleral lens education Society website. They have the best lens handling application and removal video that, that I think exists. So Scleral Lens Education Society is the place to find this video. And I should acknowledge Christine Sint and her niece for doing such a fabulous job of putting this video together. Great for patients, great for technicians, and great for practitioners themselves. So highly encourage you to use this. Now to apply the lens, what we generally do at Pacific University is have the patient pull down on their cheek with one finger just pulling down on the cheek and then bending over at the hip while standing, we'll reach over and pull up on their upper lid and bring the lens toward the eye. When you've got a really experienced contact lens wearer, you can even ask them to retract back lower and upper lids, and they usually can provide enough space for you to get the lens in. But for a new wearer, it may be helpful for you to be pulling back the upper lid. So patient standing back at a 45 degree angle, head flat to the plane of the floor, and it's much easier for you as the practitioner to apply the lens when you also are standing. When the patient's seated, you have to get down so low to be able to see that lens being applied on eye. Now, once the lens goes on, the first observation you wanna make is, do we have any bubbles? If you do, then that's going to create a dry spot that's going to be agitating to the patient. So the lens must be removed. Any bubbles that are in there um, will be an issue for the patient. They won't be able to wear it for the duration of time you need in settling. So take the lens off and reapply. When the eye is quiet, generally you can apply the lens. And what I mean by that is if you have an experienced contact lens wear and they're used to bringing a lens toward their eye, the eye stays quiet, the lens hits the conge 360 degrees around and then it traps that fluid in there. If the patient gets queasy and 
the eye starts moving around when you go to apply it you may hit the landing zone on partial cornea and on the opposing side partial sclera and then the fluid may leak out before the lens finds center so then a bubble is left over so quiet eye and these this application process is quite easy now if the lens goes on and it has an inappropriate depth if it's hitting the central cornea then we have to remove it and reapply a deeper lens now how much higher would you go if this is a 4000 micron lens how much higher in the trial set would you go And basically, if we add 200 microns, that might clear the cornea, but it may be that we're 400 microns too low, our sagittal depth of lens 400 microns lower than the height of the eye. So I would start with at least 400 microns higher if you have a lens that goes on eye with touch. What we're targeting is 300 to 400 microns of apical clearance on application. When that diagnostic lens goes on eye, you want lots of fluid between lens and cornea. The reason for so much is these lenses are going to sink and settle a great deal. So you want to have enough vault to allow for that settling. Now, if you have an O CT. This is a beautiful instrument for understanding the uh, relationship of lens to cornea. But be aware that your OCT was not designed to measure co a contact lens, then the fluid behind it, and then the cornea behind that. So it's very often that the OCT can make gross errors in the amount of fluid between lens and cornea. So to be sure, always do an optic section. Determine the thickness of your diagnostic lenses. In this case, the ICD FlexFit is 0.3 millimeters thick or 300 microns. Take the known thickness of the lens and compare that to the fluid thickness behind. And here we might say if the lens thickness is 300, the fluid is around 300, maybe slightly thinner. Certainly in this area, thinner over the cone than it is uh, relative to the lens. In the image on the left, we see the lens thickness here of 300, whereas the fluid appears to be at least double, maybe in the neighborhood of 700 microns of apical clearance. So do your optic section on the apex. Make sure that you have that 300 to 400 on application. Then we can allow it to settle. If you have too much fluid, that's okay. We can always calculate a custom lens with our consultant that will have the appropriate fluid layer. If you have the time, though, take another lens out of your diagnostic set. Put on a slightly low lower lens. Again, again, the target is 300 to 400 microns, but in a panic, more fluid is okay. Less fluid or touch, not okay. Now, numerous studies have shown us that scleral lenses sink and settle quite a lot, and this is just a few of the many studies on scleral settling. Our group at Pacific University looked at the original ICD lens and it settled over an eight hour period approximately 127 microns on average. Matt Kaufman looked at three different scleral lenses of three different diameters and found an average settling of approximately 109 microns over an eight hour period. John Mountford in Australia looked at the apical clearance on application of the lens, then he measured the apical clearance after 30 days of wear and found in the neighborhood of a, almost 150 microns of settling. So consider that your lenses may settle on average about 125 microns. So you need to begin with enough fluid to start with to allow for that settling. Now, in that settling period, we want about an hour, if possible, to allow for that lens to sink in. If you only have five minutes and it's just too rushed a day, that's okay. But just be aware that if you haven't allowed that lens to settle, you don't know if it's going to sink into touch in the center, into the peripheral cornea, sink into touch at the limbus, or 
or possibly create a tight edge. That's not going to be immediately observable in the first 15, 20 minutes of lens wear. So after settling, we want to see that lens clearing through all corneal, peripheral corneal, and limbal tissue, then landing itself down in a safe manner out on the conjunctiva. When we assess GP lenses, corneal GPs, things are relatively different than anything we do in a scleral lens. As an example, what we're comfortable with is having this very thin fluid layer at the center where we can make out the pupil, we can make out the iris. There's just a tiny hair of fluorescine visible in the center. Then that lens should touch itself down, landing on the peripheral cornea with a healthy edge lift. The lens we expect to move at least a millimeter, maybe two or three millimeters with each blink. And these things are all so different relative to a scleral lens. With a scleral, that lens shouldn't move a great deal. It should be landing itself down on the conjunctiva and be relatively stable and move very little. This is why these lenses are so comfortable. On a comfort scale, a soft lens is usually a nine out of 10 to a new contact lens wear. To a scleral patient, it's normally an eight to a nine on a comfort scale to a brand new wear. And that's because the lenses, just like soft lenses, don't move a great deal. But what's different in the center is how that lens should vault by so much, we may not see the pupil, we may not see the visible iris, we may not see any anatomy underneath that lens with proper illumination and fluorescein behind it. So everything is so different with scleral lenses. Now to understand the ICD flex fit and any modifications that you might need to make, it's helpful to understand the four principal zones. Each one is labeled according to the anatomy that should be um, below it. So the central clearance zone should clear the central cornea. The peripheral corneal clearance zone should clear the peripheral cornea. Limbal clearance zone, guess what it should do? And then the scleral landing zone should be the only part of the lens that the ICD flex fit touches down on. Now, when you assess these zones, it's, it's essentially just what we talked about. The central clearance zone should vault through that central corneal tissue with 300 to 400 microns of fluid on application, 200 to 300 after settling. The peripheral corneal clearance zone, where your first tangent is, should run relatively parallel to the tangent peripheral corneal surface. Then the limbal clearance zone should link the vaulting of the peripheral corneal clearance zone with the landing in the scleral landing zone. So the limbal clearance zone should link up the vault with the landing, but clearing through the limbus in between. Then lastly, your scleral landing zone should be its point that it touches down and puts all its weight and pressure. Now, when you're thinking about the two different diameter lenses, do you have different zones to consider? And the story is it's really easy to get your head around the ICD flex fit because both the small and the large diameter share the same number of zones, four, and the same number of uh, considerations within those zones. Clearing central cornea, clearing peripheral cornea, clearing limbus, landing on sclera. So in that first zone of the lens, begin your assessment of your scleral fits from the center to the periphery. And in the central clearance zone, do we see in either the small or large diameter, any point that the lens is touching down or is thin enough that it may touch down on the central approximately nine to 10 millimeters of corneal tissue. In in cobalt light, what we're looking for is just definite clearance. And it may be tough to make out the pupil, may be tough to see the iris underneath. And that's because you'll have lots of fluid, lots of fluorescein. Now, if that lens goes on eye with inadequate depth, you are moving up in sagittal depth, whether it's the 14.8 set or the 16.3 set. If I put on a 4,000 micron lens and we only have 90 microns of apical clearance, 
pre-settling, I should probably take that lens off and put on a 4200 lens. You're now adding 200 microns. We should have 290 microns in this case. We may lose 125 microns after settling, but that should still leave us with plenty of fluid. If you have a high amount of fluid, maybe 600 microns, that might be worth putting a lower depth lens on eye. But again, if you put on too much sagittal depth, we can always calculate a lower amount in the custom. But if the lens hits the central cornea or hits the corneal tissue, we're not sure how much higher we need to go. Always better to overshoot. Now moving out in the lens from the center zone to the next outer zone is the peripheral corneal clearance zone. And what we're looking for here is simply that the lens vaults through the peripheral cornea. Same for the small as for the large diameter lenses. Here we see a lens that's landing probably at the limbus as well as the peripheral cornea, but clearly that lens is landing within the peripheral corneal area. So by ramping up the peripheral corneal clearance zone, that creates a lens that now safely vaults through the peripheral cornea. If we allow a scleral lens to lay itself down on the cornea, it's likely to create some staining there, some desiccation of epithelium. So try to vault through that area. And your consultant can assist with those kinds of modifications. But to get your head around it, think of it like a drawbridge. If you have inadequate height to get through, then this angle of the bridge must change. So using the tangents of the ICD flex fit, if I want more vault or more depth, I'm going to order a peripheral corneal clearance zone to the plus side. If I want to create less vault, I order a peripheral corneal clearance zone to the minus side. A one-step adjustment equals 25 microns. Now, in scleral lenses, 25 microns is very, very little. When you make your adjustments, it's normally in the 100 micron steps. So if we wanted to increase the vault through the peripheral cornea, we would probably order peripheral corneal clearance zone plus 4. 4 times 25 equals a 100 micron adjustment. But if you need a tiny little adjustment, of course it's there. You can make a one-step 25 micron change. Now moving out in the lens, we've gone through the first two zones. Now let's go out to the limbal clearance zone, the third zone in the lens. And of course the limbal clearance zone should clear the limbus. So if you see a lens that lays itself down on the far peripheral cornea and at the limbal border, then you want to call up your consultant and ask for a higher limbal clearance zone angle. Once you receive that, then that lens should have the added depth that you need out there to clear over that high elevation. One of the things we don't know before we fit a scleral patient is what is the scleral angle. If, if a particular eye has a high scleral angle, then your lens needs to similarly have a higher angle. And this we don't know until we put on a trial lens. In this case, this patient would have had a higher angle than the standard median angle of most eyes. And therefore, we just call up the lab and order a limbal clearance zone with greater steps to that zone. Now, similarly to the peripheral corneal clearance zone, a plus adjustment creates more depth, makes this angle go up and raise the height of the lens. A minus adjustment, again, would decrease the angle, making it lower, bringing it closer to the eye. So in this case, you see the OCT showing a lens that is awfully close to the peripheral cornea and limbus. This is pre-settling. If that lens settles in, it's going to be rubbing on the peripheral cornea. We need to increase the limbal clearance zone. We need to make this angle go up. And that's what we've done here. The angle has gone up and that raises the lens off the peripheral corneal tissue as well as off the limbus.
Now, as we discussed, a one-step adjustment is 25 microns. 25 microns in a scleral lens is very, very little. So you typically will make a five-step adjustment to the limbal clearance zone when you need extra vault at the limbus. Now, moving out to the final zone of the lens, your scleral landing zone. What we're looking for here is the touchdown or the landing of the lens. In white light, do we see the fluorescein molecules come to an end as we reach that landing zone? Or is the fluorescein squeezed out as the contact lens presses itself into the soft spongy conge? But at the tip, does this edge dig itself in, is it too steep? And that's one of the observations we want to make 360 degrees around. So when your scleral landing zone is coming in at a very steep angle, when your scleral angle is much flatter than the average patient, then you'll see that tip dig itself in and that will create the blanching that we see here. The vessels all backing up at the edge of the lens, creating a whitish blanching just inside of the lens edge. So this is a patient that has a scleral landing zone that's too steep for the underlying surface. Simple adjustment, we call up our consultant and we ask for an increased edge lift or scleral landing zone adjustment. What we want our lenses to do is point along the surface of the eye, running parallel to the angle of the underlying surface, allowing the vessels to freely flow past that lens edge. Now, when you're adjusting the scleral landing zone, these are smaller angular adjustments. If you have one acute side, let's say just the temporal side that's blanching, you'll order scleral landing zone minus one. If you have two opposing points of blanching at let's say three and nine o'clock, then we'll order scleral landing zone minus two. If you have greater than 180 degrees around the conjunctiva of blanching, then you're gonna order scleral landing zone minus three. It's rare to need less edge lift. That would be very uncommon in the ICD flex fit. Normally the lenses will sink and settle in and the tip is right where you want it to be. At times it might be too steep, in which case you're ordering scleral landing zone to the minus. But why is it a minus adjustment to increase the edge lift? And the reason is, if you take any contact lens on the planet and increase the edge lift, what does that do to the sagittal depth? And of course, any edge, increased edge lift creating in a contact lens will reduce the sagittal depth, will reduce the apical clearance. So every zone in the ICD flex fit that you are changing to the plus is increasing sagittal depth. Any adjustment you're making in the minus is decreasing the overall sagittal depth. So increased edge lift is a minus adjustment. Now here's a, a, a case that is very commonly seen and one that uh, I feel that I made a lot of mistakes on in the early days. You look at this fit and say, our contact lens is decentering temporal and inferior. It's easy to see the visible iris on this side, not so much on this side. Lots more fluid down here because the lens is decentering down and out on this left eye. Well, do you need to modify this section of the lens? And this is a, a confusing thing when you're starting in scleral lenses because you, you were told the lens should vault through central cornea, vault through peripheral cornea, vault through the limbus, and land down only in the periphery. But this is thin. And is it so thin that it may actually be or end up as touch? Why does that happen? Well, the OCT studies tell us pretty clearly that the nasal elevation of the sclera is quite high relative to the temporal side. So nasal elevation higher than the temporal elevation that drives your scleral lenses to the temporal side. Now going north versus south, 
the superior sclera generally higher than the inferior, which may drive the lens toward the inferior cornea, then you have lid force that is also pushing the lens down. So we have anatomy and lid force that's pushing the lens temporal and inferior. Not much you can do about that, that's nature. But is this an issue? And that's the question. So should we be modifying with our consultant the limbal clearance zone? What you're going to do is a, what's called the fixation change test. If you have thinning or bearing on the nasal side, have the patient look in the opposite direction. If that area clears, then you know it's not heavy touch. It, if anything, it might be mild or benign touch, but more likely it's just the fluid is thinner here than it is here. Now, north, we see this thinning superiorly is that touch. So we'll do the fixation change test, have the patient look down. If that lens clears, then chances are it's a non-issue. Nothing to learn looking nasal or superior because it was already vaulting well in that zone. When in doubt, is this going to be an issue? Then have the patient wear the lens for a period of time, at least four hours. And that way, if you remove the lens and see any staining there, you know it needs to be modified. If there's no staining, then uh, that lens is probably just hanging above the surface, but it's so thin in fluid, you can't see it. Now the ICD FlexFit 14.8 diameter comes standard as a symmetric landing. There's no elevation change to the landing in the periphery. And that's because OCT studies have told us pretty clearly that the scleral sh elevation around the clock nearest to the cornea is relatively symmetric. So when you're fitting smaller scleral lenses under 15.5 millimeters, a symmetric surface will generally be appropriate. When you have a larger lens that's landing farther out on the sclera, now it's running into more asymmetric or toric shape sclera. Therefore, your ICD FlexFit 16 3 millimeter diameter lenses are what's called dual depth. They have two different depths between the flat and the steep meridian. And you can think of it as a toric landing. And that creates an improved alignment with the more toric or asymmetric sclera that it lands on. Now the larger 16.3, as we said, has that dual depth periphery with about 125 microns of toricity that's created throughout the limbal clearance zone and the scleral landing zone, where it's most apparent is in the landing of the lens, the scleral landing zone. Now, when you place the lens on eye, you'll see in your larger 163s these two inked scribe marks in your diagnostic. Your customs won't have the ink. What you want to know is, are the lenses rotationally stable? If they are, that tells you you probably have a good match of the toricity of the back surface to the toricity of the eye. The second thing they tell you is if you have residual or lenticular stigmatism that needs to be added to the front of the lens, can you place that on the lens and have it rotationally stable? So if your markers appear in the same position after settling, then rotate the lens 90 degrees off axis, see if they come right back to the same resting point then you know when you need a front toric lens that it can be applied and the lens will stay on axis. But important that you note that axis when you need a front toric. You, you don't just want to record the refractive cylinder axis. So there's two things that you're going to record, is the axis of the scribe marks, and they can be literally be anywhere around the clock. It's not like a soft lens. They're not meant to be at three and nine o'clock. The flat meridian scribes find the flat meridian of the sclera, and that is an unknown. The corneal 
astigmatism and the scleral astigmatism align only about 30% of the time. The vast majority, your scleral astigmatism and corneal still will be at two completely different places. So you need to tell your consultant or the lab what axis are these markers positioned at? Not is it 10 degrees of clockwise rotation or 45 degrees of counterclockwise. It's what axis are they rotationally stable at? Then, of course, you want your uh, cylinder axis to be provided when we need the front toric. About 30% of patients in scleral lenses require a front toric lens, which is odd because in corneal G nowhere close to 30% of our patients require a front toric lens on top of their corneal GP platform. So it's an idiosyncrasy of, of scleral lenses. 30% of your patients may require a front toric. Remember that the flat meridian scribe marks can be anywhere along the anywhere in, in axes around the eye. And then your refractive cylinder axis can be completely different and it's rarely going to be 90 degrees apart. So that should be unsurprising to you when you're marking down what is the axis of the dual depth scribes and what is the axis of my refractive cylinder. Hopefully 70% of the time you a spherical optic will work and we won't need the front torque. Now, the ICD FlexFit 14.8, as we said, comes standard as a symmetric landing. But when you deal with those small percentage of eyes that actually have a very toric sclera close to the cornea, you can order it as a toric landing. Conversely, the 16.3 is toric because the vast majority of eyes that you land on with the larger lens are toric or asymmetric. But when you, you're dealing with that small percentage of symmetric eyes, then you can order the 16.3 as a symmetric lens. In part two of this webinar, we'll be discussing the asymmetric landing that you can create. Now, now to kind of finish up, a couple things that we want to consider is on application of the diagnostic or the custom lens, no touch should be visible within the center of the lens. We want that lens to go on eye and completely vault through central cornea, peripheral cornea, and limbus. If that lens is laying itself down on the peripheral cornea and at the limbus, we need to call up the consultant and order a limbal clearance zone plus five. If we see less than 180 degrees of that thinning, then do the fixation change test. Look temporal, see if this clears. Look inferior, see if this clears. If it does, it's most likely not an issue. But when in doubt, have the patient wear the lens for a number of hours, take it off, stain the cornea, see if there's any disruption of epithelium in this area. If they're not, then you know you don't need to modify it. If you see any blocking off of the vessels, then you know you need to alter the edge lift. So call up your consultant, order scleral landing zone minus one, two, or three, depending on the severity. If the vessels are running right past the lens edge, then you know you've got the appropriate fit of the lens. So think about the zones. You have four zones, each labeled according to the anatomy that it's over. Central clearance zone should clear the central cornea. The second zone, the peripheral corneal clearance zone, should clear the peripheral cornea. Limbal clearance zone should clear the limbus. And then our final zone should create the safe and comfortable landing. When you're dealing or thinking about the 14.8 millimeter lens, consider less asymmetry consider smaller diameter eyes, consider oblate corneas. Anything with lower amounts of asymmetry, a 14.8 can work. If the eye is also associated as being smaller in visible iris diameter, then certainly a 14.8 would be a, the right choice. But generally, you're going to start with the 16.3. It's going to have an easier time, especially with more irregularity. Certainly in the keratoconists and the transplant patients, it's the right, right first choice. Think microns at all times. Your sagittal depth 
just pardon me, your diagnostic lenses are labeled according to sagittal depth in 200 micron increment steps. Of course, 3,800 microns being the lowest, 5,400 microns being the highest. Then within each zone, one step adjustment alters the sagittal depth 25 microns. And each zone is the same. One step equals a 25 micron sagittal change. So if I order peripheral corneal clearance zone plus one, I'm increasing the vault at the center 25 microns. If I order limbal clearance zone plus four, four times 25, I'm increasing the vault at the center of the lens 100 microns. If I order scleral landing zone minus two, I'm decreasing the sagittal depth 50 microns at the apex. Why prescribe the ICD FlexFit? The use of multiple tangents and its unique landing are two of the reasons which creates this incredibly forgiving fit. The number of modifications required are incredibly low with this lens design. In fact, ABB Optical looked at the thousands of fits that they had over a period of years and showed that the average number of lenses with the original ICD was 1.5 exchanges per eye to achieve success. And this is pretty good considering that we're really only using scleral lenses in the most irregular and diseased eyes that we face. Now, if you have any questions after this webinar, please reach out to the ABB Optical Group if you're in the US. If you're in Canada, it's Cardinal Contact Lens or Precision Technology. Either company will be happy to assist you with questions about diagnostic lens access, modifying the lenses, um, how you get support, the things you need to consider when fitting. There's experts at both ABB as well as the two companies in Canada to assist you through the fitting process. The next webinar, part two, will cover more advanced concepts, and that will be July 31st at 6 p.m. Um, Pacific Time or 9 p.m. Eastern Time. Additionally, if you'd like to attend a live session where you may get some hands-on training, a full day of education is planned for Toronto, Canada on September 9th. It will be an all-day session, and for more information, please reach out to us, and we'll be happy to tell you more about that session as well. So thank you everybody for logging in on, and on, on behalf of ABB Optical Group, Cardinal Contact Lens and Precision Technology, we sure appreciate your time. Any questions that you've asked during this session in the notepad, we will be answering and providing along with a link to this recorded video. Have a great night and thank you very much again for logging in.